good afternoon and welcome to the Assembly of YAH here in Marseilles, Illinois. Today is the 23rd of June, 2012. We've had uh, Pentecost a couple of weeks ago. Uh, everyone is feeling very spiritual. We've had spiritual studies and during that time, one of the three times that we are required to travel for the feasts, Deuteronomy 16.16, 16, for Pentecost we went over to uh, Fort Wayne to see Abigail Moroff, Pat and Nicole Fowler, and some other people over there and we had a wonderful time. We hope that you are traveling for the feast and keeping the feast properly. Today we have a prophecy message out of Revelations and we're going to talk about two subjects that uh, a lot of people don't talk about. I think it's going to be very interesting. We're going to look into prophecy. We're approaching the end times. Yeshua is coming back soon, he says. So we're going to talk about that and look at that and, and try through this message to prepare ourselves for Yahshua's return. But at this point, as we always do, we'll turn the program over to Beverly for praise and worship. Hallelujah. The first song we're going to sing is um, number seven, and then right into eight is the Sabbath day.
going to number 14. Heavenly Father, I appreciate you. <laughs> selections of songs today, praise and worship to Yeshua and Yahweh. It's interesting because in Isaiah 6.1, we're going to look at Isaiah 6.1 because Isaiah said he saw Yahweh the king. And he's talking about Yahweh Shua, Yahshua of the Old Testament, who came in his father's name, Yahweh. And we also sang about 
Yahweh created all things. Yahweh is creator. That's talking about Yash Yahweh Shua, who is creator. Yahshua created all things. John said that. That's in Colossians, and it's in Revelations also. At this time, as we normally do during the service, we're going to take our time to make our prayer and request known before Yahweh and Yeshua. Remember on the Sabbath day, which is Yahshua's day, he made this as a memorial to <laughs> his creative power and his throne and his righteousness for his people. His throne, his door, and the Father Yahweh's door is open wider. Their ears are more attentive, as it says in Numbers 10, to receive our prayers. This is a very, very important day to pray all that's in our heart. So we're going to do that at this time, but I would ask you, no matter when you receive this tape, this DVD, that you would also mention these names in your prayers, because there is no time with Father Yahweh and with Yahshua. Joe Wagner, an elder out at uh, YAIM Roachport, is very, very sick. He's been sick for about three years, and he is in very bad condition. We ask you to pray for him, Joe Wagner. And also Tom Shackey's wife, Kathy Shackey, who has had, I believe, um, rectal cancer. And she has had several operations. She's undergoing chemotherapy now. We don't necessarily would go that direction, but uh, she has suffered a great deal. She has not recovered yet. Please pray for Kathy Shatke. And also, Bob Wells, uh, who worked on the Word of Yahweh, was a project manager about seven years ago on the Word of Yahweh Bible up in Michigan. He normally attends Sam Graham's uh, Assembly of Yahweh. He has leukemia, and he's been fighting this about five years. And now he's in and out of the hospital about every three weeks, and he's under chemotherapy. He's very, very sick. He's a wonderful man, a dear friend of ours. We went up there about three weeks ago to see him. And please keep Bob Wells in your prayers also. Thank you for your love, your faith, your charity, your prayers in these things. And we'll be back with you shortly. Praise Yahweh, praise Yahshua. The title of this message on the 23rd of June, 2012, is Yahshua's Letters to the Seven Assemblies. We're going to look at Revelations chapter 2 and 3, the letters, the revelation and letters that Yahshua gave to John in the Spirit on an island of Patmos about 90 A.D. when he was in exile that he was to write, distribute to the seven assemblies, and now we have written for edification for us. They thought, the disciples thought, and John thought, that Yahshua was coming any month, any year, coming right back. They thought he was coming right back. All through the New Testament, the renewed covenant, we see the apostles saying, he's coming shortly, prepare, the time is short. That was 2,000 years ago, two days to Yahweh and Yahshua. Now we are at the very threshold of the tribulation. It's at least three and a half to four years away to start the actual tribulation. It's at least from this fall seven years away till Yahshua's return and every fall that he doesn't, the signs do not start. We have a message on that, the signs of the end time. Every fall that he, the man of sin does not make a covenant with Jerusalem, we are eight years away. Eight years away that we don't see the thing start in the fall. But he could be as close as seven and a half years away. The tribulation could be as close as four years away. The time is short, and we don't know what our time is. We may be alive tomorrow, we may not be alive tomorrow. So our time is always at hand. We need to be ready for Yahshua. This message, when people read the seven letters to the assemblies, think and look at it as if it is just messages to the seven assemblies, congregations. It is actually two messages. It is actually two, there's two important parts to this section. Yahshua who he is, what he looks like, what he likes, what he dislikes, and we have 
great insight to what he wants from his bride. We are the bride of Yahshua after we're baptized. And then, what he's telling these seven assemblies. And what's going on with them. Every assembly, more or less, with some minor variation, deviation, every assembly of Yahweh, every congregation of Yahweh, every congregation of Yahshua, because he's high priest over the assembly, they are not congregations of Yahweh. They're congregations of Yahshua because he is the head of the assembly. We are his body. They're actually named wrong, actually. But every assembly today could fit into one of these seven patterns with some minor changes. Do you know what? Every person can fit in to the description of these seven assemblies somehow. So we look at the micro and we say, what am I doing right or what I'm doing wrong? Do I need to repent? Because that's the message of the seven assemblies, that we should repent. All right? Our calling is based on repentance, turning back to the truth, coming out of paganism, coming out of sin. Sin is transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. So you might say there's three messages here. Uh, what about Yahshua? We're looking at him. What is he saying to the seven assemblies? And do we need to repent as individuals or assemblies? He says, I'm coming soon. We believe now that it's sooner than we thought. It says to look up for our redemption draws nigh. So let's start out with the introductory scriptures today. We're going to Revelations, but I want to start an introduction and go to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, verse 11, and then we're going to 17. Revelation 1, 11. And I'm going to use the word of Yahweh from Michigan. I think it's a, a good translation. John receives this revelation. He says, I was on the Sabbath day in the Spirit. He was praying. He was seeking Yahshua. He was praying to Yahweh and Yahshua because he knew there were two. And he knew that Yahshua was over the assembly. And he's praying to Yahshua, and all of a sudden he gets this vision. And this man appears to, Yah, uh, to John in white raiment. He heard a trumpet behind him, and he turned and he saw a man. And this is what that man said. And that man, of course, is Yahshua HaMashiach. Saying, I am the Aleph and the Tav, not the Aleph and the Omega. That's Greek. It's in, it's, this is written in Hebrew or Aramaic. I am the Aleph and the Tav, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it to the seven assemblies which are in Asia, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Notice he says he identifies himself. In the Old Testament, he says, I am Yahweh, Yahweh Shua, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. He's identifying himself as a pillar of smoke, pillar of fire, the Elohim of Moses and Israel. Here he says, I am the first and the last. What does that mean? It means that he lives forever, who was and is, is to come. It identifies him as the I am. It also shows that he is creator. I am the first. Because he's in charge of the creation. John said that. Uh, Paul said that in Colossians. It says that in Revelations, that he is creator of heaven and earth. We said Yahweh in the song today, but we were talking about Yahweh Shua. When I say Yahweh Shua, I'm, I'm letting people know, brethren, know I'm talking about Yahshua of the Old Testament who comes in the name of his father, Yahweh. He is the first and the last. Why does it say the last? Because he's coming at the end of the book, as it says in prophecy, to judge the assemblies in the end time. But he cannot come back until Yahweh, Psalms 110.1, Psalms 110.1, he can't come back until Yahweh 
makes his enemies his footstool by the plagues and killing approximately two billion people of the wicked. And then Yahshua comes and Yahshua destroys another two billion. And he's coming to judge. But he is will, from the throne of Yahweh, he will, before that time, as we enter into the tribulation, he's going to judge the assemblies because it says that judgment starts at the house of Yahweh, Yahshua. And we are judged as brethren every day. We are evaluated every day in this calling. All right, let's go to verse 17, Revelations 1.17. And when I saw him, John said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, for I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. Makes a reference to Yahshua being impaled and dying three days, three nights, and being raised from the dead. That identifies Yahshua as Savior and Redeemer. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of grave and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. It identifies here as the one who died for us, the one who's over the assembly. Yahweh is not over the assembly. Yahweh has given the assembly into Yahshua's hands. When we need something in the assembly, when we need healing, when we need revelation, when we need something of the offices of Yahshua, we pray to Yahshua, not Yahweh. That is a problem for some people. And we still are preaching, we are still saying, and we still experience in the assemblies that the assemblies are leaving Yahshua thinking that they are doing righteousness and on the right track because they give all worship and honor and glory and prayers, adoration and attention to the Father. And leave Yahshua almost entirely out of the picture. Is it possible that we can be praying to the Father and dedicating our life to the Father in Yahshua's name, using Yahshua's name, calling on Him, being baptized in His name, but ignoring him, giving all attention to the Father, and when Yahshua comes, he might say, I never knew you. Is that possible? The assemblies need to repent of that. As long as we're talking about assemblies repenting, we need to repent of that and turn back. We're going to see in the first letter to Ephesus a major problem that relates to exactly what I'm saying, that we need to turn back to Yahshua. It's always been that message, hasn't it? Because in the Old Testament, when the prophets said, repent and turn to Yahweh, it was really returning back to Yahshua. Because Yahshua is Yahweh the Old Testament. It's always been about him, to the worship of the Father who is above all. Not to leave the Father out, but to have balance. The first and the last, the one who was dead and now is alive and lives forever. And he says, write these things, what you have seen. Because John had a clear, powerful, direct vision of the throne, of the elders, of the uh, four beasts or the four creatures which fly and praise Yahweh and Yahshua constantly and of the end time. And here, Yahshua is saying, look, I'm going to show you something. I want you to write it down, what you've seen, which are, because the assemblies in Asia were still functioning at the time that John was on Patmos, even though they had left Paul, the one who set him up. They had left Paul, which always is very dangerous. You leave Paul then, you leave Paul now in his teachings, and his writings in the Renewed Covenant, and you were in serious trouble because, as we do here, Paul's main mission to the Gentiles was to preach Yahshua, and him impaled, and him resurrected, and him at our right hand, and him as head of the assembly, 
and him as Redeemer and the one who's coming back and raises us from the dead. He is our husband, our high priest, kinsman, Redeemer, and the author and the finisher of our faith. Not Yahweh. Yahweh, who is greater than Yahshua, whose plan all of this is because he loves us and called us and redeemed us by his son, has given all this power and authority and position to his son. And we need to acknowledge that. The churches which are and the things which shall be hereafter but they're not hereafter, are they? If this applies to us now, if he's coming very, very soon in the bat of an eyelash and in just you know, in a moment, because 10 or 12 or 15 years is a moment, just a moment, a second, a couple of seconds in Yahweh's time, they are not hereafter anymore. He's talking about the assemblies today that have come together in the name of Yahweh and Yahshua to worship in spirit and truth. So they have two major meanings here. We're going to learn more about Yahshua and we're going to learn what he wants to say to us as the assemblies and as people as we approach this end time. Some of the theologians and, and early fathers thought as history looking at these letters that these were assemblies only and this only applied to the assemblies, the seven assemblies, in 90 AD in that time. We know that applies to us too. Others have written and said, well, these seven assemblies represent <clears throat> the evolution of any assembly. May go through these seven stages. Or every assembly may experience one or two or three of these problems within their assembly as prototypes. We believe all the above, but mostly today we're saying in June 2012 that he's talking to us directly and we better not have these problems. And if we do, we need to be honest with ourselves. We need to humble ourselves and pray and repent. The entire assembly, not just the stars, not just the pastors, not just the shepherds, not just the elders, not just the choir, all of us. And if we find these kinds of problems, we need to proclaim a day of fasting and prayer and humble ourselves and repent. This is serious stuff. Serious. I don't want to be part of an assembly who is going to receive severe judgment and chastisement. I don't want to be a part of that sin. I don't want to be a ground zero. I hope that I'm not part of the sin. It's dangerous, dangerous things. How would it be for, for me or you to keep our, ski, our skirts clean but be associated with an assembly that is condemned? I don't know how that would shake out and how that would appear. We are not to fellowship with those who openly sin. We are not to fellowship with those who walk disorderly, Paul said, but dis disfellowship ourselves, separate ourselves. These letters are talking to us right now. We're going to do something different today. When you have your scriptures in front of you, you would read this in order, all the comments and all the scriptures, starting out with Ephesus, and you would just read through all of Ephesus and try and get a picture of what's going on in Ephesus. But you know you lose something when you do that. And what I had Beverly do today is take and list in categories on the top of a page all the seven assemblies, but on the sides the five things that are going on in each of the addresses letters to the assemblies. Who's speaking? What is he saying? What does he like? What does he dislike? 
and what are the consequences of the rewards. We're going to look at those categories, and instead of going straight down and reading all about Ephesus, we're going to start all the way across and read all the salutations and opening statements of who's talking, Yahshua. And then we're going to go down and read all across and talk about what are the good things he sees in the assembly. And then we're going to look and see what he says is about what kind of sin is going on and that they are to repent. The next category down is the consequences if they don't repent. And then if they do repent, what is the reward he will give them? This way we're going to get a clearer picture of what Yahshua likes and what he dislikes. We're going to put a lot of emphasis on Yahshua and his message. You know, if Yahshua came to us today and he sat down in the assembly, or, or let's, let's say that he talked to us just like this letter, these letters, seven letters, we'd probably want to take notes, but we couldn't because we would be so dumbfounded and, and just on our knees probably almost passed out as John was. But I tell you for sure that we would want to get an, exactly what he was saying, understand exactly what he was saying, remember in detail, in order, exactly what he was saying. We want to make sure that we understood this thoroughly. Isn't it true? We wouldn't want to miss one jot, one tittle, one comma. We're going to try and do that today in an, one hour, less than an hour now. Judgment starts at the house of Yahweh. Remember, I want to emphasize this, that Yahshua has all authority, all power in heaven and earth. All things are given into his hands. He is king of king, master, master, sovereign, sovereigns. It says in Colossians 1.18, he says, he is the head of the body. Colossians 1.18, he is the head of the body, the assembly, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Same statement, right? That in all things he might have power, authority, position, using the word preeminence, which is basically authority in all things. He is judge of heaven and earth, not Yahweh. Before we get into the letters, because the first very category, the very first category we're going to look as we read across in the seven assemblies is category one, is what does Yahshua look like? Do you know what he looks like? Because Moses, in Exodus thirty three nineteen, saw Yahshua on the mount in all of his glory. So much glory, so much power. Yeshua said, if you see my face, you will die. So he put him in the cleft of a rock, put his hand over him, passed by, and Yeshua saw his Shekinah, the back side of him, just the back side. It was so bright and so powerful that Moses came down and shined brightly. And it scared Israel. He had to put a veil over his face. You can find that in Exodus 33, 19 through 23. Moses saw Yahweh of the Old Testament, Yahshua. You may say if you're new and you don't understand, well, that had to be Yahweh the Father. But it says, no man, three times in the scriptures, no man has seen fa Father Yahweh or heard his voice at any time. Moses saw this one. You can find that in Exodus 33, 19. Isaiah 6, 1. Isaiah saw Yahshua. In Isaiah, Isaiah 6, 1, Isaiah says, I have seen the king. I have seen Yahweh, the king. And I am undone. No man has seen Father Yahweh. Isaiah saw Yahshua. Daniel saw Yahshua in his vision in Daniel 10, 5 through 6. That's Daniel 10, 5 through 6. Daniel said, I lifted up my eyes and looked. He heard, the, he heard this sound. He turned, behold, a man clothed in linen whose loins were girded with fine 
gold as as Opaz. Opaz is a place where fine gold used to be manufactured. His body was like unto beryl, and his face is the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet were the color of polished, burning, bright brass. Brass. I've added a few words there. And his voice is the voice of multitudes. In other places it says many waters, multitudes, many waves, and waters. Who else saw Yahshua? Well, the, the apostles lived with Yahshua, ate with him, slept with him for three and a half years, but he was not in his esteem. He left his esteem to come down to be flesh, didn't he? But in Matthew 17, 2, we have the vision, the Mount of Transfiguration, where before Peter, James, and John, Moses and Elijah, in a vision, this is a vision now, appears to Yahshua. They're dead. They're not alive. But in this vision, they saw Moses and Elijah come to Yahshua, and his presence, his likeness, and his vesture was changed as bright as the sun. Peter, James, and John saw the glory of Yahshua. Remember, Yahshua prayed, Father, I would that they could see the glory that I had with you before the worlds were. Remember that? And Peter, James, and John saw it. Now, John, now John has this revelation. We're in 113 through 15 now, and he sees the same person, the same image, the same likeness, the same identification. By the way, when you do the study, Yahshua looks just like Father Yahweh. If they were standing side by side and we could see them, which at some point we will, after the millennium, you won't be able to tell them apart. Revelation 1.13, John says, In the midst of the seven candlesticks, that's the menorah, one like unto the Son of Man, that means he's born of man, Okay, that's, John uses that expression to verify that he was born in the flesh, son of man. This menorah represents, you can see it over here, I believe. Menorah represents the seven spirits of Yahweh, which are in fullness in Yahweh and Yahshua. But in the metaphor, in the candlestick, Yahshua is the servant candlestick, the center candlestick that feeds the others. But he has all these seven spirits. Talks about the seven spirits being before Yahweh and Yahshua at the throne. John sees these seven candlesticks, one under the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girded about the paps, about the chest with a golden girdle. That's the gold. His head and his hair were white like wool and white as snow, and his eyes were as flames of fire. This is the same person. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as a sound of many waters. If you've ever seen li liquid molten brass, it is so bright, it'll put your eyes out. It's like looking into the sun. John knew that he was Looking at the king, he knew who this was. Let's go to the charts. Let's go to this, these descriptions, and we're going to go from left to right. We're going to do the description of who is talking first. So we're going to go through the description, the first part of this Revelation's letters, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. We're going to go sideways. Description, Ephesus. Who's talking? He that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. Those seven stars are the seven assemblies and the pastors of the seven assemblies. The stars represent the minister, the chief shepherds of the assemblies. 
who walketh in the midst, remember the center candlestick, the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Who can deny who's speaking here? It doesn't matter whether or not the chief shepherd or the chief elder in an assembly is in the hand of Yahshua. He's there for guidance, revelation, understanding, wisdom, the seven spirits of Yahweh, Isaiah chapter 11, wisdom, counsel, might, understanding, power, fear of Yahweh, Yahshua. Yahshua is there to edify, guide, and lead that elder and the whole assembly. And even though that elder is in the hand of Yahshua personally, doesn't mean that he can't sin or be deceived or led in a direction away from the truth. Because at the other side of his right hand, at his left hand side, as we see Yahshua, high priest, who stood at the other side of Yahshua? Satan. Because it says in the scriptures, when the saints gather, Satan rises up. The leaders can be deceived. They can be deceived. They can be led by fleshly sin and lust. They can be drawn into the world and be worldly. They are only men, even though they have a higher calling. But they also have a higher responsibility and a more, much more severe judgment that lays upon them. But they're worthy of double honor if they do well. So it says they're in the right hand of Yahshua, but it doesn't mean they're all doing righteously. We're going to find out they're not. So who's talking to Smyrna? These things saith the first and the last which was dead and is alive. Is there any questions? That's Yahshua. He identifies himself to Pergamos. And he says, These things saith he which has a sharp two-edged sword, the word that proceeds out of his mouth, the two-edged sword, which can kill or heal. Does it sound like judgment? Who is it that's talking to Thyatira? These things saith the son of Yahweh, He's the son, that's what Peter said, you are the son of Yahweh. Also, I think Nathaniel said that. Who hath his eyes like unto flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. We just read that, didn't we? Who's talking to Sardis? What does he look like? What does it say? We're talking about Yahshua here. It's all about Yahshua. These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of Yahweh and the seven stars. The king, Yahshua. Philadelphia. I'm going to put Philadelphia last, even though in your book, in the scriptures, Philadelphia is the sixth. I'm going to put that last. Let's talk to Laodicea, because as we see this go down through the assemblies, if you look from left to right, they're getting worse and worse and worse. Laodicea is a dead assembly. These things saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of creation of Yahweh. Colossians 2.15 He is the firstborn of all creation. That word is prototokos there, firstborn, and it means authority of the firstborn, not the first to be created. Here it says the beginning of creation. It doesn't mean he is the beginning of creation. Yahshua was not created. You cannot prove that out of the scripture. He is an Eloah who existed time out of mind. It means here that he is the beginning of creation because he spoke the beginning. I am the Aleph. I'm the beginning. He spoke into creation things which did not which are which do not from things which do not appear. He is the beginning of creation because he is the creator. We have a book on that and a study if you'd like to see that. Now it's very, very interesting, and I want to come back to this because I think that's what I need to do after we go through all of these, that when it talks about at the very last 
line that we're going to go through, the rewards or the consequences of their actions, it is linked to what he says about himself in this first line across his description. So we go from the first line description to consequences and reward, the fifth line. We're going to come back and link that together. It's very interesting. You can't do that. You can't see that unless you reorganize this into another chart. And you can send for this chart if you like. Now, Yeshua's grace is full of mercy, long-suffering, patience, charity, goodness, all the fruits that he wants us to have. So in the second line across, as we look at each assembly in the second area, it's the positive things. It's the positive things he starts with first. Yes, Beverly? We didn't do Philadelphia. Okay, we didn't do Philadelphia. Okay, we don't want to leave out the good guys. Philadelphia, the, the city of brotherly love, they had love. They had everything. Philadelphia had no rebuke, and it was lifted up to be the best assembly. But let's see what he says, how he identifies himself to Philadelphia. These things saith he that is Kodesh. We, we sang that today, didn't we? His people cry Kodesh. The creatures in Revelations cry Kodesh around his throne. He is Kodesh, he that is true, he that hath the keys of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, that means he has power and authority to do anything he wants, and he shuts and no man opens. Power, authority, position, statue, stature, the keys of David here, or the key of David, is an ambiguous statement. A lot of us don't know what that means. And basically what that means is, is that he has authority, as David did as king. Only greater authority because he's over all the earth. It means authority of the king. And the king has rules. He has commandments and statutes and judgments. He has dictates and things that he says to his people. And guess what? He says, Blessed are those who read and do the words of this book and keep the commandments of Almighty Yahweh. So that dispels any question whether or not we should keep the commandments, the statutes, the judgments, the holy days, Torah. He's talking to assemblies who keep Torah and have been baptized. The members have been baptized in the name of Yahshua. They know who this is and they know, they knew when they got the letters, we don't know if they believed it or not. When they got the letters, they knew who the letters were from. Whether they believed it or not, we don't know because we don't know if they repented. Alright, the positive thing is we're going to have to move along here. We have a lot more to cover. The positive things he said about the assemblies. Ephesus. He says, Thou hast borne and hast patience for my name's sake. You're going to hear that over and over. The name is very important. You cannot be saved in any other name than Yahshua HaMashiach. For my name's sake and hast labored and hast not fainted. So he, he's got a good, some good things. What, what does he value here? They've borne the burdens. They've done the work. They've had patience. They have stood up for his name, exalted his name, and they have not fainted. They haven't given up. They're, they're still working. Okay, it's, a, it's hard, but they're still working. What does he say to Smyrna? I know thy works, and you've suffered tribulation. You've gone through some very difficult times. And your poverty, which I believe is humility, but you're rich. And it says another place that says in the scriptures, Paul says, Hasn't Yahweh chosen the poor of this world rich in faith? And I believe that's what he's saying. Smyrna had faith. What does he say to Pergamos? He says, Thou holdest my fast my name. There it is. Very important. And has not denied my faith, even in those days where Anipus was my faithful martyr. He was, he was uh, 
burned alive inside of an open bull that was a brass bull that was used for demonic uh, ritual and pagan pur purposes. Who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth? Domitian, a emperor of that time in Pergamus or near Pergamus, it was believed that Dom uh, Domitius was the one who had him killed. What does Yeshua say to Thyatira? What are the good things he says? He says, I know your works. You, you do work. And the works are not keeping the commandments. That's our reasonable service. That's our covenant. Works is feeding the poor, poor, visiting those in prison and the sick, helping the widows, the blind, the oppressed, the, the, the sick, healing the sick, showing love, preaching the good news. I know thy works and character and service, what? Service to me and the brethren, and faith and patience and thy works. And the last is to be more than the first. They're, they're doing better. They're doing a little bit better. All right? What does he say to Sardis? I know thy works. He knows everything about us. He knows what's going on in the assemblies. He knows what's going on in our lives. I know thy works, and thou hast a name. And thou livest, but you're dead. In the very first line where he says something positive, he wants to be positive, he wants to be uplifting first. He can't because Sardis is doing so badly. He said, I know about these things, but you know, you're alive, but you're actually dead. You are dead spiritually. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. So that's as good, as good as it gets. Hold on to what you're doing. Don't slip any farther. Because you're going to be out. You're going to be cast aside. You're going to be lame and cast aside. Hold on to the things which you have. Laodicea, he has absolutely no positive things to say about Laodicea. It is a perfectly dead worthless, dark assembly. And you know what? I'm going to say this so I don't make sure I don't forget this. Yahshua is not even in that assembly at all. Period. Nada. Donut. That's why he can't say anything positive about them. Philadelphia the best assembly that's doing well, he's very proud of. He says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door that no man can shut. And thou hast a little strength. That's what Daniel said. And they, my people will have a little power, a little strength. Remember Daniel said that? The ones who overcome. And has kept my word, all of his words, and has not denied my name. There it is again. My name, my name, my name. You cannot be saved in any other name. There is no name. Yahshua, send for the study of the DVD. Yahshua's name is above everything that is created in heaven and earth. His name is above all things. And every knee, it says, will bow to that name. It's not greater than Yahweh's name, because Yahweh's name is in his name. But his name is above everything else in heaven and earth that is named in heaven and earth. Let's go to level three. We went through description. We went through the positive things. Now, let's talk about the rebuke and the corrections. What, what does he have pro what does these assemblies have problems with? What did Yeshua identify as problems in the assembly? Of all the things that are going on in the assemblies, he picks out the one thing or two things that he wants corrected right now. What's going on in your assembly? Ephesus. Ephesus has a severe problem almost as bad as Laodicea. And I gave a message on this. Send for the message, have you left your first love? Here's what he says to Ephesus. Nevertheless, after the good things he said, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. What is, what is our first love? Yahshua. 
While we were yet sinners, Yahshua died for us. I am the first and the last. Sound right? We can't be in. We can't please Yahweh. We can't have Yahweh. We can't make it. We can't receive this first fruits reward. We can't receive this eternal life through first fruits calling as priests and kings, the first resurrection people, the called out ones, the ecclesia, the bride, the firstborn. We can't receive this honor without Yahshua. And Yahshua said twice, in Matthew 7, and I think it's Matthew 25, he came, the door was shut, people came to him, believers came to him, believers came to him and said, let me in, and he said, uh, depart from me, I never knew you. I never knew you. Is it possible to worship Yahweh in the name Yahshua and have no personal contact, no relationship, no interaction no intimacy, spiritual intimacy with Yahshua? I think it is. And you know what? We know people that are actually leaving Yahshua. Leaving Yahshua. He is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way. He is the sheep gate. Return to your first love. Very serious. Let's go to Smyrna. He says, and I know the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews, Yehuda, Yehudin, and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. And I believe here that he's talking about, and he mentioned Jewish people in another place, that he's talking about these ones that followed Paul around. They hated Paul because they thought Paul was preaching against Torah, saying that we're saved by grace. We are saved by grace. Not of ourselves, lest any man boast. But after we're saved, after we accept Yahshua, we turn around and keep his covenants. The law, Torah, is covenant law. We have to have a covenant with him. He's the husband. We are the bride. We're married. We're betrothed right now. These Jewish men, probably Jude called also Paul called them Judaizers, were going about disrupting Paul's ministry, Peter's ministry, and trying to even get these men killed. Paul and, I think, Silas uh, were almost killed in Ephesus. They brought them down into this uh, large amphitheater and were going to make sacrifices to them. And they said, no, 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 we are, we are like men of you, of like passions. And, and, they, and the Judaizers turned the crowd against them, almost got them killed. When it says in the scripture that we need, that it's a Jew inwardly and not a Jew outwardly, it means the faith of Yahuda, the faith of Yahshua is what it's talking about. Here, these men are going around creating trouble. He says, I know them, that they say they are Jews, but are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. These, these people are in the assembly of Smyrna. And they need to correct that, correct them, and maybe even put them out. Let's go to Pergamos. Yeshua says, Thou hast them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast stumbling blocks before the children of Israel, stumbling blocks before this assembly, to what? To eat things sacrificed to idols. They were having fellowship with idolatry and paganism. And to commit fornication. And I believe here this is physical fornication, because idolatry is spiritual uh, uh, fornication. In fact, it's probably both. Probably both. So they had fellowship with idols. They ate things sacrificed to idols that they knew were sacrificed to idols. They had fellowship with pagans, and they were committing uh, spiritual and physical fornication, sexual sins. Now, Balaam also, the doctrine of Balaam, is also the doctrine of fleecing the flock, pray and pay, of taking and accepting and demanding more than the normal tithes that Yahweh says that he, in Deuteronomy 12 and 14, that we should pay. And Malachi, he says, you rob me because you do not pay tithes.
tithes and offerings. Worldwide Church of God, that's a bad name, but Worldwide Church of G.O.D., their main, their main objective was to get as much money from the members as possible. They would even exclude people from joining their groups <coughs> that didn't make enough money or wouldn't give enough. And they kept very severe track of who gave what and even would reprimand them if they didn't give enough for what they said. Tyre, Tyra. Because thou hast suffered that woman Jezebel, he says, I have somewhat against you because you've uh, suffered this woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, and she's not, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication, to eat things sacrificed to idols. Well, what we have here is a very similar sin that we see in Pergamos, but he's, they've allowed a woman to get up and preach and teach in the assembly who calls herself a prophetess, and obviously she's not, right? She can't be a prop, true prophetess of Yahweh because she's teaching and encouraging the assembly to go into sin and defilement and adultery and paganism, right? So she's not a true prophetess, but they can't see it. They're deceived, and they're allowing her for some reason to get up to preach, to teach, to prophesy, and to lead the people into paganism. And he wants her out of there. And they want this, he wants this assembly to repent. Sardis. Sardis. He says, I have not found thy works perfect before Yahweh. And that's all he says. That's all he says to Sardis. Your works are not perfect. It sounds to me that he gave them other information, sent other people and other prophets and ministers and people, elders to Sardis, because just to say that, they would not know what they were doing wrong. And, and Yah Yahweh and Yeshua don't work in confusion. He lets us know exactly what he wants us to change and repent of. So they may have other information, but it's not written here. He just says, I've not found your works perfect. You're not doing the things that are pleasing to me. And he tells them to watch. Laodicea, he says, I know thy works and thou art neither hot nor cold, and I would have you either hot or cold. They're lukewarm. They're asleep. They don't care. They're not motivated. They're not inspired. They're not, they don't have any zeal. They're going through the motions of keeping the holy days and praying and going through the motions of keeping Sabbath and showing up the Sabbath meeting, but they're not hearing. They're not listening. They're not edified. They are not repenting. They are not alive. They are so dead. They are so passive and so asleep that he says, because you are neither hot nor cold, I don't want to get into consequences, but he says, because, because you're like this, I can't use you. I cannot use you like this. And I have tried and tried and tried, and, and, you, and you don't change. He says, if you don't change, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. What does that mean? It means I'm going to disfellowship you. I'm going to walk away from you. I'm going to reject you. And they're going to be lost. We have covered now, we have covered the first two or the first three parts of these letters. We have covered the description of who's talking. We've talked about the positive, and we've talked about the negative of each one of these assemblies. And we're going to make this presentation part one. We're going to stop here. And next, what we're going to do on part two is we're going to go to the consequences if they do not repent. The consequences if they don't repent, and if they do repent... If they do repent, he's going to give them a reward. We're going to talk about the reward. And then we're going to bring this all together about what he says to the assemblies. Because that's what he's saying to the assemblies today. Are the assemblies preaching this? No. Are they looking at revelations and teaching revelations? No. 
of the assemblies preaching repentance and turning away from sin and defilement and carnalness and worldliness. No, they're not. So pray for us. Pray for the assemblies of Yahweh, the congregations of Yahweh. Pray for the body of Messiah. Because this is the time to repent. This is the time to get serious. There isn't much time left. I hope this has been edifying. We're going to finish this next week. We pray this has been a blessing to you. If you have any questions, give us a call here at the assembly at 815-357-9926. That's 815-357-9926. And talk to me, Mike. We'll be glad to send out DVDs and studies to you for free, answer any of your questions. You have a blessed week, whatever time you get this, and be filled and encouraged and led by the Spirit of Yahweh and Yahshua, and we'll be with you next week. Hallelujah. The song I'd like to sing is Consider the Lilies.
that was beautiful, Beverly. Praise Yahweh, praise Yeshua. We are saved by grace, unmerited favor. Yahweh calling us for his son to be a bride to his son. We receive Yahshua, repent of our sins, law-breaking, paganism, hardness of heart, get baptized in his name. And we come into this salvation calling, which is really about priests and kings being priests and kings, leadership cadre in the kingdom. We're going to reign with him a thousand years and beyond. <coughs> so we listen to Father Yahweh's call. We receive Yahshua as our personal king and savior. And then we keep Torah, which is our covenant agreement with them. And we repent as we see that we need to, as he brings us on the road of conversion. But I tell you the truth. Love covers a multitude of sins. Keeping Torah will not save us. Even following Yahshua won't save us if we don't have the entire package. If we have hardness of heart toward our brother, unforgiveness toward our brother, we won't make it. Love covers a multitude of sins. I want to read the last statement in this Revelations 22. Yeshua says in Revelations 22, 12, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. He's the one that's going to come and reward us. We're not going to be judged when he comes. When he comes, he comes with his reward. We're judged every day. We'll be judged before he comes. He comes with his reward. Reward is with me. To give to every man, that's a believer, every man according to his work shall be. I am the Aleph and the Tav, the beginning of the end, the first and the last. He identifies himself, who he is. Verse 14, very important. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, that's eternal life, and may enter in through the gates into the city, that's New Jerusalem. That is our ultimate goal. But it doesn't stop there. We need to love Yahshua and Yahweh, as the Shema says, with all of our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength, more than anything else in this life. Children, wives, jobs, anything. That's the only way we're going to make it and submit ourselves under their, their guidance. He lays a plan out for us. It's good news. And every time we do something right, we're blessed. It's a win-win situation. But it's a struggle. He says, those who suffer for my sake will also reign with me. So we need to embrace this program, embrace his words with all of our heart. We'll be back with part two next time. Yahweh and Yeshua bless you and keep you safe. Hallelujah.